versions of inflate that I was able to pull out of our TMC uh, right before the, I built this talk. I just did a query. So version information like this is very useful because they will continually relink to the same version. Then they'll upgrade later and then they'll relink to that for a while. These, uh, in particular, Zlib, even if they strip the copyright information out, here's a little known fact about Zlib, there's a special binary pattern embedded into every single version that's changed, and it's actually changed by the maintainer of Zlib. So even if you didn't have the copyright string, you could still find this particular binary pattern and figure out what version of Zlib you've got embedded in the system. And if you want to see more on that information, go to this website that I've got at the bottom of the slide, and you'll get a database of all those patterns. The same thing apply, applies to the inflate library. There's a secret internal pattern that you can use to figure out what version you're dealing with. And again, it's linked off that same site. OK, how does it survive reboot? This particular one is really interesting because it's been using the same method to survive reboot for five years. Um, it creates a DLL. The DLL name will be IP, or it would be anything, but uh, I've seen IP in RIP or IP RINP and different variants, but the registry key itself will always be IP RIP. And it's used a lot to, to essentially register these remote access tools. So that's a really awesome thing to search for because it's by default not on in your organization. If you wanted to take one thing out of this talk today, go back to your enterprise and see if you have any uh, services loaded under that key. It's very likely that they are not supposed to be there. Um, here's a way to find the base of kernel 32. So this, again, this is something that's very specific to the way a developer writes his code. He's going to first mask ESI in order to find a page boundary. This is a technique that he's using. Then he uses ECX to control the length, because that's what you use ECX for. And he does a backwards scan. So that's an interesting thing to note. He subtracts. And then if he fails, he tries a whole bunch of hard-coded offsets, like a Hail Mary at the end. And if he can't get any of those, then he fails out. That's a pretty good fingerprint for this guy. OK, let's talk about command and control. I'm actually going to make my talk, too. It looks like I'm a little ahead of where I thought I would be. Command and control, that's how does it communicate to its control server once it's on the system. So the exploit will come in, and one of the first things the exploit's going to do is connect back out on the internet and download a real piece of malware. Because the exploit itself is usually not the malware itself. Uh, it's actually just the thing that has a download capability. The thing that drops the malware on there, that's what I was talking about earlier, where they can change their MD5 checksum every single time. Once that malware installs itself, it typically sends a hello message to the C2 server to announce its existence. And I've seen some rather elaborate schemes that query a whole bunch of information about the operating system before that hello message goes up, including hard drive serial number, whether or not there's a domain administrator account on the machine, a timestamp of it, of the machine, a CPU serial number, version of the OS, et cetera. And so here's actually a graph showing all of that behavior. This is out of one malware. This is a really great fingerprint. Um, first, it queries the uptime of the machine, and then it checks the power settings to determine whether or not the machine in question is a desktop or a laptop. Then it enumerates all the drives, and that would include anything that's external storage as well, like a USB stick, gets the Windows username and computer name, CPU information, and then the version and build number of Windows. All that's packaged up into one packet and sent up to the C2 server. There's a lot of different variations in command and control. A lot of it's done over the web, HTTP, HTTP or an HTTPS. Uh, but Aurora was a little bit different. It actually didn't use standard HTTP. It just looked like it. But once you opened it up, it was a custom implementation. Those are things you can use to fingerprint those attackers as well. And those are things that you can look for at the perimeter of the network. IRC is not so common anymore. It used to be used with botnets quite a bit. But now it's mostly web-based stuff. Um, the reason why they sent all this information back up to the server is because they have a big SQL database on the back end that's managing all their infections. Here's the Aurora command and control parser. At point A, the command comes in as a numeric command. It's not written out as text. And then at each location, marked in B, are all the different code, all the different uh, subroutines, essentially, that will run based upon the number that's at A. So essentially, you have right here all the capabilities of the remote access tool essentially defined for you. Once those things have executed, they regroup at C and send the result back up to the server. This is a great fingerprint. And then finally, let's talk a little bit about stealth and anti-forensics. I'm going to zoom through this a little bit fast. But anti-debugging tricks, a lot of them are placed by packers, so they don't make that good of fingerprints because the same packer will be used by a lot of different people. But if you get anything that looks like it was hand-coded in there, you're in a great spot because it's going to be very unique. So in this case, in, this is a divide by zero error being caused, and then the structured exception handler will catch. This would detect whether or not a debugger was attached. Um, so I'm just going to go through some slides showing some different stuff that an anti-debugging uh, capability might have in it. So is debugger present? 
That's just a flag stored off the FS register, but people will actually make the API call, which then just reads the flag. So at the bottom, you can see, well, actually, you can just read the flag directly, too. I've seen code where it just pulls the FS register directly. It doesn't actually use the API call. Heap, manip heap manipulation flags will be different if there's debugging present, and that's another technique that's used. And you can see the uh, assembly language that would be used down there to make that test. Again, more on heap flags. Things that are not obvious, you wouldn't think would be changed. The debugging environment significantly changes when you're debugging. Um, so we can also check for the debug port, and we can get this response back, letting us know whether or not there's a debugger. Uh, this is another function call that will do something similar, check to see if a debugger is present, except it's check remote debugger present, but it just wraps the same query that we just saw, anti-query information process, and it sets a flag to true. Okay, so here's something that's done at runtime. If you're single stepping, uh, malware may detect whether or not the trap flag is set. There's various mechanisms to do that. Now, you can defeat that if you're in the kernel and you're managing it, but this is another trick that a lot of debugger detection code will have in it. And then um, ZW close with an invalid handle will result in a, an exception if the program is being debugged. It's kind of a non obvious one. Um, you can set, okay, well, I'm just going to pass through the rest of these. I guess it's worth mentioning read timestamp counter. Uh, you can tell if you're being debugged if you halt, you know, you're single stepping and the timestamp counter is not being maintained, so too much time passes. Now, if you do a search on the net, you'll find a lot of code in the open source that does a lot of this. Okay, this is where we're going to get a lot more interesting. All right, so this is GhostNet again. This is going to the algorithm level I was talking about, where the algorithms hardly ever change because it's so hard to get software to work right. This is the algorithm that does the screen scraping, remote screen scraping of your box uh, with the ghost wrap. Every 50th line on the display, it counts by 50. Then it takes a diff against the previous snapshot, so it's not going to send all the raw data again. So it compares those to the previous one four bytes at a time. And if they differ, it goes into a secondary loop where it makes a sort of a data run until the, until the difference has been um, resolved. And that puts into a data structure, offset in the screenshot where the data run begins, the length, and then the actual pixel data. And it's actually then downsampled into black and white, or grayscale. All of that is so specific that if you were to search your enterprise for that, you're going to find GhostNet. That's where, where you'll find that. They're not going to rewrite that every single morning. Um, I actually went into the source code for GhostNet, and this is a really good trick for advanced fingerprinting. If you see large groupings of constants, constants used together, those are great to go on Google code search and look for, see if you can find those constants used in any algorithms, especially things like this where they're so unique. So let's go ahead and you can see on the bottom, 8,000, 1625, 652, and 320 were all in this particular function. I just put those in Google code search as numbers. And right off the bat, I find a file that has to do with compressing a wave. And I'm like, okay, this has a, this has a remote audio sniffing capability. It can convert my laptop into an audio bug. There's no other reason a malware would have this capability in there. So it has something to do with audio. I further refine the search, and I actually find the exact source code that I was just using the disassembly for. And I know that because I looked at this, and I went back, and I compared it, and the order everything appeared, and this is it. The guy that wrote the, the uh, Ghost Rat copied and pasted this C audio class into the other system. And this C audio class is just in some totally unrelated, has nothing to do with malware. It's just floating out on the net. Okay, um, we use Palantir uh, at HP Gary for some of our link analysis. At the bottom at number one is a source code artifact, or actually an artifact in the binary that we found in the Aurora dropper. And we followed that to number two where we found a forensic tool mark and then that on a, did a search on the net led us to number three. And so we have a person at number three who posted source code in incomplete form that contained that tool mark. That means you couldn't have cut and pasted this and made that dropper. This guy only put a portion of it on there. Now, maybe behind, in a closed platform, behind closed doors, he may have shared it with other people. I can't know that here. However, I did a search on that information, found his CSDN page, his Baidu page, his QQ numbers, and then found that he had another forum elsewhere where he was selling something called NetBot Attacker. And in that forum were people asking for technical support on their copies of that remote access tool. So you can't get better than this, where you go from a forensic tool mark to the developer to the users of the malware itself. So this is the ideal. So let's talk a little bit more about what we can do with open source research. Um, this guy here, uh, 
the auto security.net, he makes a keylogger. Uh, we did an analysis with Maltigo. We found another site just using Maltigo alone where it was actually just a, a file, file AVE. It's just sh sharing files. Inside of there, unprotected, is a file that contains all of the license keys to all of his registered users. I just brought it up. There it is. Those are all the people that currently operate. So yet another example of using open source intelligence that connects a malware developer to the actual users of the malware. Now, I have no idea why this was so insecure, but you'll notice if you go through the press that there's a lot of examples of this where C2 servers don't have any authentication, and if you just know how to connect to it, you get all the data that's been stolen. Uh, a lot of security researchers have published blogs where that's been the premise, basically, of getting the data at the C2. Um, now, if you're doing this level of analysis in social spaces, one of the things you can also do is work back the timeline and find out when a particular version was first released and look in your enterprise. If you have that version, you know you were infected after that date. So you can use information like that as well. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on this, but you can penetrate into closed platforms, get into IRC channels that you know, are frequented by black hats. Um, you just have to maintain digital cover. There are ways to do that. The black hats themselves have VPN networks that are like anonymizer that you can use to pop out in any country. You can actually buy those. It's a service they give to hackers who are attacking your enterprise. So you could use one of those to go the other direction. If, you, know, you may not want to trust that, but just using it as an example. So you can actually uh, use identities and you can do contributions to their pages so that you establish your bona fides and they begin to trust you or at least enough to start talking with you and that's something you can do and it does work. Um, here's an example, recently came out, somebody hacked carters.cc. Go up there on, on a P2P sharing network if you can and see if you can get the tar file for this, it's great. Is the identities of every single user on that system and this thing is a cesspool of crime. Everybody in here is related in some way or another and all of this data and their email addresses are all now in the open source thanks to whoever hacked them. It was a vigilante hack and it was pretty awesome. Um, so defining threat groups, uh, that's something that's sort of, I'm still working with, but threat groups can't be purely identified from malware alone. You have to look at a lot of factors. So I'm sort of starting at a bigger cloud level and trying to drill down to what does the intent look like for this particular actor? And then from that, looking at their behavior patterns. An example, do they always log in during daylight hours in China? Well, they're probably sitting in a cyber cafe in Shenzhen attacking me. Um, so defining threat groups is something I'm still working with. Fingerprint.exe is the tool. You can go to the, uh, the booth that I have on the vendor floor and get a free copy of this. It's on uh, first hundred only. There's only 100 CDs down there. And then at noon today, we're going to put it up on the website as well. But here's an example output. We dropped in an arbitrary binary. Actually, no, it was Ghost in this case. It actually figured out the original project name. It figured out the developer's uh, project directory where they did the actual development from, what compiler, whether or not it has user interface embedded in it or not. And if so, it'll try to figure out the version number, whether or not there's any compression capabilities, what kind of networking does it use, et cetera. And all that will be dumped out. Now, what's cool about this is when you, you can auto-process in bulk many, many binaries, 10,000 at a time. They're all stored in a database. And then if you go and you run another binary, it'll tell you with percentage of match what it's most similar to in your data set that you already have. So here is every single tool released by Mark Rasanovich, Sys Internals. And you can see they're all closely tied. And then there's a separate group down here. So look, TCP view and TCP, TCP v con are very similar to one another, and they're on island by themselves down on the bottom. So uh, we're going to cluster. This is a great graph. This is a graph of uh, about 3,000 samples of malware and then the entire contents of a Windows 7 System32 directory. All the System32 